All right, so uh, uh, I'm Brian. That's Craig and Jesse on the other end. We're uh, two physical therapists and a professional triathlete, and we were soliciting and answering questions of that endurance athletes have. And our question today is about cramping. Uh, why do we, we cramp up? Why do cramps happen? Uh, so this is a really popular one. It's an issue that can sideline people from races. And uh, who wants to take it away, guys? Where, how do you want to start? Jesse has a lot of cramping. <laughs> uh, that's actually not true at all. So um, I guess I want to want you to answer like why we cramp because I can talk a lot about the advice I give athletes, but I don't know. I can't really explain the science of why we cramp. Well, so like, what do you do if somebody like one of your athletes that comes in tells you they're cramping? Um, I mean, the first thing we talk about is like where they're cramping um, and when it's happening during the race. Um, and and then it's kind of if it's muscular, then we talk about like um, if that's maybe one of their weaker muscles, um, and then we also talk about their uh, their hydration levels, um, and we do like I mean the question I get every time is about salt intake, um, and I know that. Um, I guess my I'm more focused on the hydration and the the what muscle is cramping, but the 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 thing the athlete continues to bring back to me is like the salt intake. And now there are all these products on the market like pickle juice shots, hot shots. Um, I think there's a cayenne pepper shot too. I don't know how that works in shots. there, but uh, I mean a million different <laughs> different kinds of salt tabs and electrolyte tabs of all all forms. Um, and that you know everyone's always trying, but I think the the big question is is that no one seems to to have any understanding as far as like why they're cramping, and they just see this sports marketing and they kind of go for that. Um, okay, but before I, I you know I think there's some myths we might want to tackle right off the bat. Before I dive in there, maybe just so we are all on the same page. What muscles in your triathletes? Let's just say, stick with triathletes. Seem to give the most issues or cramp the most often. Is there any specific groups? Um, it's it's really variable, but like I would say, like quads, adductors, calves, um, the occasional hamstring. Yeah. Um, and, and then like, like cramps actually happen uh, somewhat regularly as well, kind of underneath the arch there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. It's cool. In practice, so it's it's hamstring and, and calf for me, but I, I definitely think we can. So your quad is the most common for you? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't say it's the most common. Yeah. I would say it's more like more the, more of the smaller muscles, like the adductor, like hamstring, calf, and then foot, bottom of the foot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I think what's interesting, digging into the science a little bit of, and this is maybe a little myth busting, but with hydration status. So you need certain amount of hydration and electrolytes for muscles to contract and relax. And if you look at the muscle physiology, you need a certain amount of sodium, uh, I think calcium, maybe potassium, along with, with water, oxygen, and sugar, ATP, all those substrates for the muscle to contract. So contracting is an active process, but actually to get the muscle to release, you need a certain amount of ATP and some of those electrolytes, um, which is kind of interesting, like to get a muscle to relax, there's actually some activity at a cellular level. And so I think that's maybe where the this idea that if you're low on electrolytes, you're going to cramp somehow came from. Um, but what's interesting is that hydration and electrolyte status happens at a systemic level, like your whole body. And so if low electrolytes or low hydration or a lack of uh, ATP or something at the cellular level is going to cause a cramp, it's going to cause it at a, like a systemic level. And I think you, s you maybe see this in emergency rooms or in really like dramatic heat stroke type situations where literally every muscle will go into tetany and cramp up. Um, but tetany, one, tet meaning like, the... yeah, like everything's not just one muscle, but like everything seizes. Um, and I know that's documented and out there, but for endurance athletes, usually it's one muscle or a couple of muscles. Um, and so it doesn't really make sense that we're looking at a hydration or electrolyte issue for causing a single muscle to cramp because we're probably not dealing with a change of electrolyte status in that single muscle. Does that make sense? 
Um, it does. So just to clarify, are you saying that if a, someone has a calf cramp, the cause cannot be electrolyte or hydration? I don't know if I could say as absolute as that. Craig is saying, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, like with the yeah. control trials, I think you can you can almost 100% say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm just curious. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Or that's I could I could maybe see if you're riding that line of like total system failure, but haven't hit it yet. <laughs> like maybe one muscle that's fatigued could cramp. You know. Yeah. You know. So so maybe, but I think so, as we'll dig into, there's other issues. Oh, what was that? Sorry. Let's talk about that last thing you said about like if a muscle is fatigued. Yeah. So if muscles are fatigued, are they more susceptible to like? Yeah. running out of like like if you you know running out of electrolyte or something like and I, I don't really know how that works like if if you overwork a muscle can it use all the electrolyte that's near it and like it's harder for it to get more electrolyte especially if you're dehydrated or does that not make any sort of sense no no that, that makes can I yeah. Yeah. I mean like so the way I think of it is like the the so a muscle gets fatigued definitely fatigue has been related to people having what you if you look it up in the research is exercise induced or exercise associated muscle cramping, and so like when when we talk about exercise associated muscle cramping, what we're thinking of is uh, why is that muscle starting to cramp? And so what you're asking is somebody depleting their body? Are they going to the limit so much to the limit that all the energy stores that could allow that muscle to to contract or release are now used? Up? Is that accurate? Yeah. So when we talk about energy being used like that, we don't see energy being used in just one muscle. So, so if you see an overall systemic complete um, loss of all energy systems, like so the, the person's not functioning, mm -hmm. and what wouldn't happen would be the whole muscle cramping. But fatigue is related to it because it actually drives another pattern that Brian was about to talk about with uh, altered neuromuscular control. And so the actual studies that have been done so far, when they look at these guys going for – like, say you, you take one group, that then both groups have a history of muscle cramping, right? And they, they take the group and they, they make sure that the group is hydrated and and they, they work them out really hard and they compare it to another group that's having no cramping. There is, uh, there's no difference. Not only that, actually, in some of them they're showing that they're more hydrated and they have, they have taken in and ingested more electrolytes in the group that cramps than the group that doesn't. So it's not, it's not even like a question of... The, the evidence is so much against saying that it's, it's dehydration or electrolyte imbalance causing it, even even with what you're talking about. But there is a relationship to fatigue. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and I think there'll be, uh, you know, I think another question will be nutrition, hydration, electrolyte status. And I think there's lots of reasons to stay up on that stuff as an endurance athlete. But cramping is maybe not on that list or definitely not near the, the top of that list. Um Right. So, so I guess to answer your question, simply there's other reasons that we would think of first and that are much more supported by the literature for cramping other than electrolyte and hydration status. And I think Seriously, that blew my mind. Like the first time I read that, like yeah. I was, I mean, I, I was completely surprised because when we played football, they'd always give us honey packets, mustard packets, and then they'd have these disgusting glasses of pickle juice. All of that sounds terrible. Yeah. It was. It was just like <laughs> I don't like, like mustard like, or pickles. That's awful. Yeah. All right. So I guess I do want to really hear the answer to the the original question. But since we're kind of on this nutrition tangent, why do things like um, those those uh, like I, I guess hot shots or like cinnamon or pickle juice, those very concentrated, very distinct, um, like mustard, turmeric. Why do those things seem to have an effect on muscle cramping? Is it all like just from from your brain or is there some actual like well, I, physical effect? I mean anytime you take it in of one like being like the, the person having the subjective experience right. it's extremely hard to extrapolate like that across the population right right like the, the best data like the best data that we have like where they control all the stuff where they can mm -hmm. they can weed out that type of result says that that doesn't do anything that doesn't do anything. So like, you feel like it's it's just placebo? Like, I take this hot shot, it tastes really bad, and I think it's going to work, and it must be doing something because I feel like I'm going to throw up and my yeah. muscle cramp is gone. That's literally my yeah. opinion. Yeah. And I've, sure. I've seen a theory, and this might make more sense when we do answer the question, which we're getting to, but <laughs> that, uh, that neuromuscular control is a big piece of cramping, 
and uh, you know that that's connection essentially in lay terms of the brain with the muscle. And so, if you give something that's like really dramatic, that that somehow interrupts some of that processing or gives you a chance to change it, I don't know exactly what. You know, I think there's other more reliable ways to do that, but that's one theory I've read is that it it somehow is enough of a shock to your system that it changes some of your neuromuscular function. I don't know. That's just a theory that I read on a blog or something. So definitely not evidence-based, but I think that is one potential answer. That shocks the system. Yeah. I think, yeah. why don't you explain what the process is? Like well, what, what's actual best evidence? Yes. Yeah. Wait, best evidence about what a cramp is? Well, what's, what's actually driving it? So let me ask one more side question before we get to that. Okay. Just to keep the suspense rolling a little yeah, bit. Yeah, keeping the cliffhanger uh, going. So could you like, could it also be that your brain is low on glucose and that's like causing like the neuromuscular like failure? And so, because hmm. um, no. I mean, your brain uses like a ton of, of glucose, right? It's like, like to keep your brain going at a high level like that, that's, it's a bigger glucose consumer than your other muscles, right? So, so the way a muscle, muscle fires, though, is that it's at a local level. So you wouldn't okay. look at like, and you would see it blur across multiple things. You wouldn't see a specific muscle by itself. It would be like one connection, no. like no. petering out. All right. I was at, when I, once actually once when I was out in LA and we were we were in the lab and I had this this whole setup around my head with a transcranial magnetic stimulus. <laughs> no, because it's like this like weird white cap, and uh, they were able to do like a shock through my my uh, skull, and they could ignite one specific muscle, but it. But initially, when they tried to do that, like they were firing multiple things, and that so how the brain does it, it's like it's all it's more like thinks more in movement, like so like your motor cortex has a body has a representation of your brain, of your body, and so it's you have these maps that basically it's following. It's not like a single muscle. Okay. And so when you talk about somebody having a muscle like an exercise associated muscle cramp, it's a single muscle. Like you're not you're not seeing, you know, six muscles cramp. You're not seeing. Um, all of the the plantar flexors, like so, all the muscles that cause plantar flexion cramp. You know, that's not what you see. At yeah, all. yeah. And that, that gets more to what the, the, the best theory right now is: altered neuromuscular control. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Let, so, what is a cramp? Why does it happen? Um, so, and Craig, jump in if I mix up any of the terms here. But, <laughs> but so in in the muscles. So we'll start big picture view. You have the brain goes to spinal cord. Spinal cord goes to what we call peripheral nerve that hits the muscle and inside the muscle or around that, that motor unit, which connects the muscle to the nervous system, allows it to fire. Um, there's certain structures that give feedback and receive feedback from the brain. And so, um, so two of those are, are called the, the Golgi tendon organ and the muscle spindle. And so one of them modulates tension in the muscle and the other one modulates length and so um, one has to do with sending feedback to the brain about how how tense the muscle is so like a contraction and the other one sends feedback about how long the muscle is and it's protective against like a quick stretch so that's what causes you like contract your arm muscles if your shoulders getting stretched behind you or your adductors if you're going into a split and you don't have that range of motion it's um, and I tried to split. <laughs> And that's, and that's, uh, yeah, can you show us your adductors, uh, engaging in a split yeah, right. but on, on top of that? I think an easy way is that the Golgi tendon organ shuts the muscle off. Like right. It, it, yeah. It. And then the other one, the muscle spindle turns it on. So if you activate the muscle spindle, you see the muscle fire more. Right. And then if you activate the Golgi tendon organ, you see it shut the muscle down. That's yeah. why like if you get a calf cramp, you stretch it and that's yeah. activating the, the Golgi tendon organ, shut the muscle down. Yeah. Yeah. So we all respond to a cramp. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So your intuitive response to a cramp is to stretch it, which shuts the muscle down. But um, to get back to this, so you have these, these structures, one that turns the muscle on, one that shuts the muscle down, and then there's also control systems in at the peripheral level, local level, near the muscle, in the spinal cord, and going up into the brain that control how the muscle is firing, when it's firing, all this, you know, that's all of those things together is what we call neuromuscular control. And that can be fatigued, you know, as the muscle fatigues, as the whole system fatigues with general effort, 
you get reduced control. And so that's why we see a number of different things happen with athletes, like their balance is, is crap after they run a half marathon, or their glutes don't fire as well you know, when they're tired. It's because of this, not that the muscles are weak or their balance is bad, but they're fatigued, their neuromuscular system is fatigued. And I think, Craig, right, the theory is that these structures, the Golgi tendon order muscle and the muscle spindle, which ramp the muscle up, and tone it down, they can be fatigued as well or lead, you know, have alterations in their ability to control the muscle. And so um, I think the most common example is when a muscle is in a contracted state for a long time, um, it gets fatigued and then essentially the, the balance of that Golgi tendon organ to shut it down erodes. And then once you see that Golgi tendon organ no longer be active, the muscle just contracts and then it stays that way until you stretch it out right i totally agree i think the issue is that you don't get the inhibitory signal yeah so if you don't get the inhibitory signal you never shut it back down and so that the reason that, that to me makes way more sense than um, a global issue is that it's, it can happen very locally so like meaning like if it, instead of seeing cramping widespread cramping over the entire body you see your calf start to cramp just when your calf or maybe both sides of your cramp your, your both calves cramp but with that, that's an explanation that shows why you're having just a local effect. And and then, you know, I think that, Brian, just kind of take it even even more, like, so let's just say, like, triathlon. Um, there's something about triathlon that, that you never activate your Golgi tendon organ when you're swimming. That's yeah. why, like, the worst cramping cases, the worst Achilles tendinopathies that I've ever seen, they've all been four-foot runners, mid-foot to four-foot runners yeah. that just hook up swimming. Yeah. Or that they individual swim. So they are. That is a nightmare case because I don't think you're gonna. It's very hard to survive with that type of a foot strike because you're basically just blowing your calf up every time you go run, every time you go swim. You're causing this pattern, and that's a person that the calf cramping can actually turn into. Feels like your muscles tearing in half. Yeah, because you need just. And then Jesse, we're gonna ask you for some feedback on what we just said, but the idea that you need full range of motion of a muscle or close to it to get the these two structures to work right to get the inhibition of the muscle and the firing of the muscle and if you just stay in one state in a contracted state you're going to shut off that that inhibitory response and so what craig's saying is swimming your your toes are generally pointed so your calf is contracted you never get that opposite um and then on a bike a lot of times you have a low level of calf you know activation unless you're stretching out as you're riding because that's helping you get power and then running on a four foot strike again you're never getting that plantar flexion moment and so you never get that full range of motion that keeps this balance you fatigue it and then all of a sudden you get this this cramp does that make sense yeah i know totally it's perfect so I li i've literally never had a new triathlete who adopts a four foot strike make it through training without having to switch them to a, a rear foot strike Meaning, I've never had them run on their toes, been able to be to actually be able to make through the training. I've seen some pros do it. I've actually, I've seen several pros do it. Yeah. But it's, uh, I, I'm not sure how they got past the barrier. But I've never seen somebody who's just taking up running and triathlon, and, or not been a swimmer before, successfully traverse that. I think it's the, I think it's it is extremely difficult because of this literal, literally this problem. And I think a lot of times when people start to develop those Achilles injuries or the, like that calf cramping, like even waking up at night by a calf cramp, it's I think it's just impossible to get in front of. Even with all the right treatment, uh, it's just you 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 start to develop this motor pattern. It's impossible to get in front. It's yeah, terrible. and so you gotta you gotta change the motor pattern, which would be the foot strike. I think one of the few times where we do that, or. Um, have them swim really inefficiently in a dorsal flex position, which is hard to do. Or, I don't know. Yeah, somehow get them out of that plantar flexion all the time. Well, and even with that, like that's one of the things where I don't, I don't like. If you're a triathlete, I don't understand why you do fencing. I don't understand why you use fencing. I really don't. I mean, cause, so do you have it in your training? Uh, I'm not. No, I don't. I very rarely get fin specific work. It is the number. I think it's the number one issue when you have like with somebody who's swimming and they can't get, they can't run. It's because they're they're sitting in that plantar flex position, and then the, the calf activation is way more yeah. with somebody wearing a fin. You know. Yeah. And so if you're having this issue, you shouldn't wear fins. Like it's the number one killer. Like it, yeah. People are dying. People are dying. Fins. Right. Left, right. Oh my god. Um, yeah. And yeah. so I guess this made me think of something else is that most people, especially here, do most of their training in a pool where you're pushing off every 25. Yeah. 
I mean, if you're lucky enough to swim in uh, in an Olympic pool, you're pushing out for every 50. But in those situations, you are at least like once in a while getting that that full range of motion in your calf, right? But how do most people do it? Do most people actually go to where the heel touches and they go into dorsal flexion? Or do they or just, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm imagining people, maybe their heel touches, but then they're pushing off powerfully with a plantar flexion moment. Um, you're, you're killing my momentum here. Can I well, just, no, no. <laughs> I, I think you're right, though. I think you're right, though. Like if somebody's having this issue as a coach, I think that the way to start to work on it is they, they absolutely take advantage of going into a full motion, getting right. a stretch on. Yeah. So, but what I was trying yeah. to go with there before you guys <laughs> both shot me down, just left right action here, is that then you go to a race where you're swimming in open water and okay, you don't yeah. have to fall. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you're, that's you're, a good point. And then you're like, I never cramp in practice, and then I always cramp during the race. Yeah, and then I could see on a bike, if you're biking around town or an area where there's traffic lights, you might stop, stretch for a second. But at a race, you're going to have course no, where you're just right. going the whole time. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you're just like, your heel touches the ground and you're your calf's in a different position. Well, you know? yeah. I promise you, I, I've totally used that. Like when people get out, if I if I we know they have a history of it, get them out of this out of the out of the battle and have them go into dorsal flexion as they're as they're uh, pedaling. I know it sounds you're going to be wasting momentum, but if it's if 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 you know that you're you typically light up and get cramped during the run, if you're not doing that right at the end of your uh, right before you get off the bike, I think you're making a big mistake. You sacrifice the five second extra seconds it's going to take you. But if it saves you from having a cramp because you now initiate that inhibition cycle before you start running, mm -hmm. that's huge. Uh, it's just huge. I mean, one thing I do talk about with my athletes for longer distance races is to, like, take breaks and get out of the saddle once in a while just for, like, you know, your lower back. There's a lot of things that get very tight from riding the aero bars for a long time. Yeah. So taking those standing breaks I think is important. And, yeah. and maybe one piece to add in that is to, like, you know, try and – stretch your calves on a few of those pedal strokes when you're stranding, uh, standing just to uh, to kind of get everything a, a break. Yeah. Well, Ryan, didn't we talk about before too, I feel like you brought this up about also do activating the muscle on the opposite side. Yeah. On the bike. Yeah, well, yeah, I think, you know, the saying that I've heard before is like, like anterior strength and posterior length. And so just stretching does one thing, but then activating on the other side, that's, you know, a different neural input to, to the area. Um, you're also potentially getting, you know, some stability if it's a, a muscle that's involved in, you know, uh, you know, initial contact or loading response or your gait cycle. You're maybe helping the muscle on the other side with eccentric control by getting some activation on the other side. So yeah, not just stretching, but actively working the other side can help to come out of that cramp too. Like so, a, a good one for if it's happening while running and just stretching on a curb isn't taken away. Doing some heel walks or doing some type of activation on the front of the shin can help to knock it down and maybe let you keep running. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think everybody should have in the back pocket. If you're a mid-foot to four-foot striker, I would still practice a rear-foot strike. I, I think it's it, the benefit of a four-foot mid-foot strike is wildly, wildly exaggerated. But being able to go into heel strike, that can save you save your race. Yeah. I mean, really, race, even like a minute of doing a, a nice heel strike, pulling your toes up while you're running. Um, but I don't want to forget too. I mean, we're talking about the calf, but the other thing that I think is, is big on that, Brian, is the, uh, the hamstring cramping is yeah. activating the synergistic muscle, muscle that actually helps with it. Yeah. So a lot of times when I see the hamstring doing this, it's because they don't have any glute max involvement. So like the your butt muscle is not doing anything. Yeah. And I also think that's a driver of the exercise associated muscle cramping. I mean, I see this almost every day in the clinic is that you go to test somebody's glute max strength you put them in a position that in theory should turn the hamstring muscle off or disadvantage it and they still get a hamstring cramp trying to do a glute max specific test i mean yeah, yeah. there's a, yeah, i know the story you're thinking of so i mean did it for a big group yeah brian i was giving <laughs> yeah. i was doing it in front of this group uh of uh, of, uh i think it was a triathlon what, what, what was it? It was the uh, was Tucson the, Tri Girls. Yeah, the Tri, and, tri Girls. <laughs> yeah. And so they have a picture of, as I'm trying to do the glute max test, her hamstring cramps, and they get a picture of her face, just in absolute agony. And but I, it think, was like I think beforehand, she was like, oh, yeah, my glutes are good. And then her hamstring yeah. cramps, she was not happy oh. about it. But, but the reason why that happens is because they're relying on their hamstrings for for probably both controlling the knee and controlling the hip extension. And and then it's just overloading it entirely and then uh 
yeah, you get that process going and then you put it in a shortened position and you're just setting it up to cramp. Um, so getting the glute max and I think also the hip abductors in the game will help to offload that hamstring. I think it's a similar process with the quads. Either the hamstrings or the glutes aren't working as they should and the, it's quad dominant activity. Um, and then you get a quad cramp eventually. Yeah, that's true. What about, and I legitimately don't know the answer to this one, but uh, the, the cramp in your side, like side stitches when you're running. Do you guys know anything about that? I legitimately don't. Uh, I know they don't feel nice. Do you know, but... like, I think it's related to drinking too, this one might legitimately be related to drinking too much water. <laughs> After I said that. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, when you're running and you get the cramp like right here, like right below your rib cage? Yeah. You have any uh, idea what that's from? No, I mean, honestly, I, I don't really, I haven't had to treat that a lot. I mean, I think well, it could be, that could be a fatigue. I don't see it as a, as a huge cramp. Though. I don't think people are going to make it to your table with still having that side <laughs> stitch. Um, yeah. uh, I, I always thought it was more your diaphragm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good thought. I mean, I could be totally wrong. I don't know that much about your internal organs, but I thought it was like a, a breathing thing. Um, and <laughs> well, it's definitely going to be your 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 expiratory, like secondary muscles. Like they're going to be you're going to be exhaling harder. It's not going to be like you're just just uh, like how we're walking around, not not fatiguing. So I think I mean I still feel like it's like the secondary muscles to help you breathe more forcefully and everything like that. Yeah, it could be a it could be a similar process, but yeah, your your yeah your respiratory muscles. Yeah, that's I mean, I think a stomach cramp feels different, and like if you have like bloating, cramping like that, <laughs> like then it's like something you ate, something you drank, you know, yeah. Yeah. and that's like different feeling than like that side stitch where yeah, that's a completely different problem. That's, so like yeah. exercise associated bloating, I'm not <laughs> sure. That's a uh, we'll get that's probably a problem. Yeah, right. yeah, we'll get happy on the talk about that one. Cramp. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I don't know. Man. I yeah. do think I do think on the other one that that I think people misinterpret as cramping is that they'll have like they'll have back pain that'll cause muscle spasm, and that's that's a like a, like a, they'll have a discogenic back pain that triggers your, your like your paraspinals and some of the the other cramping to happen, but that's like a spasm, and I don't I don't find that to be that's a completely different process. Obviously, you have yeah. a another like, painful segment that's now driving the pain. Yeah, I think most the classic cramping that we're talking about, this exercise associated muscle cramping is a you know, is, is a muscle that contracts and relaxes frequently during exercise. And so the paraspinals kinda of do, but they're more endurance postural muscles than like a prime mover. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think they're responding to the that, that disc injury. Yeah. Tip. Yeah. Um yeah, back pain I think we could dig into a whole other another topic, but maybe to wrap up so we've talked about a little bit why muscles cramp, some of the myths around there. Um, we've touched on a couple things athletes can do, but what can we do to prevent muscle cramps or treat them when they happen? You know, I think treating when they happen is try a stretch, try an activation of a muscle on the opposite side, or if it's in your thigh, either quad or hamstring, try a glute contraction. Uh, anything else while it's happening? And just to uh, jump on that a little bit more is, is this doesn't it doesn't mean you need to be stopped on the side of the road, like doing serious stretches, right? Like while you're running, like um, you can really like you know stick your hips forward and really focus on your glutes. And see while you're running, like really try and like like I mean almost do like heel walks while you're running or like while you're riding or whatever you know like you can keep making forward progress. And I think that's um, that's something I see people like being totally sidelined and, yeah. and I don't think, I think if you stop, it can almost make it worse Yeah. because you know, you're going from like, you know, full gas to no gas and your body's trying to like figure out what to do now. And, um, so I think that trying to work through these things, but work through them appropriately is, um, maybe the advice we're giving. Yeah. Well, right. So I might, I'm going to dive into gate a little bit yeah. so so like if you think about it though like so to me it's it's if you understand when that muscle is going to be used the most that's like the very first that's the first part to attack on so say you're at mile 20 which is i for me when i have runners come in or traffic it's always that kind of that nasty i'm fatigued and now i'm trying to push through that fatigue that wall it seems to be when it triggers so with the calf the calf is going to be primarily involved when you get to mid stand so in all your weights on your body 
to where your foot comes, your heel comes off, that's a gigantic load on the calf. And so, and then when we talk about the hamstring, it's going to be decelerating your leg swinging forward. So for both of the problems, my, my initial thing is shorten your stride. Yeah. So immediately shorten your stride because that's going to reduce the amount of force going through both of those muscles. So if it's your hamstring, really shorten your stride to so increase your turnover and squeeze your butt at the same time. It sounds weird, and I think people should practice it, but it, it, it is so effective. And I've had people who, you know, we train that. We train that. Like, when they're going to go for the race. It's like we train that on the treadmill. We train that. Okay, what we're going to do here, we're going to make sure that you can actually produce this motion. You're going to anticipate that you're going to have that cramp. If you don't prepare for it and you're somebody that constantly has it, I, I just find that to be a big mistake. And then with the calf one, we already talked about, but you also shorten your stride because that reduces the tension going through that muscle, the load going through the muscle. But if you pull up with your toes the whole time, you're getting that reciprocal inhibition the whole time that's shutting the muscle down just a little bit. Extremely effective. Yeah. And practice your heel strike. We know that's going to take load off. I mean, if you're hitting with a forefoot or midfoot strike, you're going to have a transient peak and activation in your calf. Like it's going to be a bigger load to it. So if you're somebody that's always having calf cramps, it's just maybe not the way to go. Yeah, because you're, it's cause you're, a, you're adding a new calf load that's not as present with a heel strike at, a, at initial contact. So I think that's the first. I mean, I think those. I think that's the first thing. And I think the second thing, Brian, is to normalize those synergistic muscle combinations. So like, make sure that the other plantar flexors are involved. Make sure that your anterior tib is involved. The muscle on the front. Make sure your glute max is involved. Your hamstring. Yeah. You know. Yeah, same thing with, yeah, so make sure everything that's supporting that muscle is active. You know, I think that's especially key for foot cramps because there's, you know, foot cramps I think can definitely plague people, especially triathletes too because your foot's active in the, the kick most of the times and on the bike. But, yeah, making sure that the anterior tib, posterior tib, peroneals are all strong and active. And those are things that can be addressed in a warm-up. Uh, they can be addressed, you know, as part of a training routine. You know, you don't have to go, go do them at a separate time necessarily. Oh. And I do think I do think the other thing, if you're getting foot cramping, what I've also been catching a lot more often with cyclists than I than I, I just haven't been aware of it, is people will push down with their toes. Like they'll start to claw in the shoe. And I may not realize this, but you have muscles, you have these plantar intrinsics, these thick, strong muscles on the bottom of your feet. If you curl your toes down and try to dig your foot into the into the uh, shoe, you're activating muscles. And so you're keeping them in this contracted state the whole time. So if you start to get that cramp, pull your toes up. I mean, it's just it's so effective and just recognize if you're doing that. And the easiest way is to take your insert out of your shoe, out of your, uh, uh, what's it called? The uh, insole? The insole. <laughs> take the insole. <laughs> and see, see if your toes are, are digging into it. You know, like are your toes digging into the into the uh, footbed? And if they are, you're doing that. Yeah. Especially if you're if you're having like heel pain, if you're having like that cramp in the bottom of your foot. Yeah. You know? And then I think this is common sense, but I see people uh, not do it all the time. But as soon as you feel even the hint of a cramp, do one of these things. Change your, change your strike, shorten your stance, squeeze your glutes, check whether you're digging in with your toes, all of the above. As soon as you start to feel even that little hint that you might have a cramp because it's way easier to dress then and you can manage it throughout your, your training run or your, your race. Uh, but if you wait till you actually have a cramp that you need to manage, it's going to be much more difficult. So try to be in tune. You know, I think a lot of runners are task specific. They just want to blow through and get to the end. But being a little more in tune with what you're feeling during the race before those things come on. Yeah, you're crazy if you start a trial. Anyway. So, um, one more thing I wanted to add in just for kind of like practical advice is like when I'm doing this myself or when I'm telling athletes to is I say pick like a chunk of time. It's like take 10 seconds and do this for 10 seconds mm -hmm. and then run normally and then try again um, or, you know, ride with your toes up and just do it for like 10 seconds and then keep going. Um, you know, you don't need to say, I'm going to run the next six miles like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, know, you can do like small like strides um, and that can affect the next six miles without you having to totally run differently for that entire amount of time. Do you think it's panic? Do you think that you go into a panic state? Is that why? You're panicked that it's going to get worse. Um, I, I honestly wonder what drives it because there's like I, I've I've seen where I think it's just like they panic instead of allowing like allowing stuff to work, they panic. They try to say oh, it's not working, and then they. Well, I, I, I think that people don't think there's a way back. I think that they mm -hmm. say once they feel this cramp coming, it's going to come at some point, and there's it's totally out of their control, um, unless maybe they've been convinced that if they take a bunch of salt or 
drink a gallon of water or <laughs> drink pickle juice, um, then you know there's nothing else they can do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I used to. I some guy told me to race with mustard packets in my pocket. I've done it before. It's, like so, you you ate a mustard packet during your race. Well, I had it with me just in case. You know? <laughs> do you I still do you still do that thing. like day to day? Just have them uh, just. In case. It, well, uh, yeah, I have one. Do, do you guys have one? <laughs> oh my god, eat a mustard packet while you're right that hard. I, I mean, don't see. I've never I've never done it. I'm just, I'm, you know. Yeah, I immediately like so they had honey packets, pickle juice, and mustard, and I ate honey because I'm not crazy. Like, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing I eat, eat honey. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah but I mean. I, I think that kind of covers about how I think about it initially. I think there's way there's some other things to do, Brian, but I mean, I think that's a good start. Yeah, I mean, I think those are the basics that people can do on their own. And then if it's not going away or if the same muscle is cramping all the time, that, yeah, again, that's that's don't just keep hydrating. There's something going on with your gait, your swimming, or your cycling that's driving that process. Um, and yeah. so just thinking a little more deeply or, or asking for help if you can't figure out why a single muscle or a, a group of muscles is cramping. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's a good review. Yeah. Also awesome. cramps. Um, if you're watching this far, thanks for watching. Any questions or questions you want to watch or uh, have answered in the future, uh, toss them in the comments or, or you reach out to me. Uh, my email is brian at evolvedflg.com. So let us know what you want to hear about and we'll dig into it. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, guys.